Uh, my name's Jack Burdum in uh, W-A-F-T-Q, or uh, that was my mentor, W-A-T-E-E. And next to me is Al Peter, A-C-H-E-Y. And Al can't talk too much because he has a uh, laryngitis right now. And both of us are on the tail end of some rather bad juju from the last week. But uh, we're going to struggle through this uh, presentation. If you have questions anytime, we're fine with you jumping in. If you rather hold until the end, that's fine too. Either way. Okay. I should have said beforehand that we use the raise the hand method uh, or the chat. That keeps confusion of people from doubling on everybody. Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm ready to start sharing. Okay, you got it, sir. Turn me on. Okay. Uh, right there. Can you see the? Yes. Okay, you can see the presentation? We certainly can, sir. Okay. Um, space bar, right? We're talking about building a, that's, we're, we're talking about building an SDT and uh, oh, wrong. No. go ahead. Where is it? It means? No. There we go. We're calling it a software defined transceiver. And we think the distinction is, is real. Um, we see a lot of discussion in papers and presentations talking about SDR. And I think it's confusing because SDR really is just the receiver section. And we know that there are a lot of SDR devices around and some of them cost as little as $10. Others cost, um, several hundred dollars. And some of them actually are quite good. SDR Play, for example, uh, costs several hundred dollars, but it is a very, very good uh, receiver. However, the software defined radio is traditionally implemented in hardware. And uh, I'm sorry, a regular radio is implemented in hardware. The main difference with the SDR, of course, <laughs> is that we're trying to push a lot of that hardware off into the software end of things. So the advantages of software defined receivers. First, we're trying to get rid of the high cost of, of hardware. Um, it's very easy to change feature sets with, uh, with respect to software versus making hardware changes on in, in the circuits themselves. You can expand that feature set and you can do it without having to play around with the hardware. Now, the T41, we've renamed this, we're calling it now the T41EP. And the EP stands for Experimenters Platform. And the reason for that is that we're designing it with the idea that people are gonna build this thing but they're also going to hack it. Um, we'll have more to say about that in a second. But it's going to be a five-band, high-frequency, software-defined transceiver. We're only planning 80, 40, 20, 15, and 10 right now. And for the U.S., that means that we are leaving out some of the bands, but not that many. The modes that we're going to support are single sideband and CW. We can receive AM but we are not doing anything with other modes. Um, we draw very heavily on the convolution SDR work being done uh, by Frank and his group in Germany. And they have a lot of modes in there that we're not playing around with like RIDI, for example. Um, so we're, we're gonna stick strictly with uh, the single sideband and the CW. We do not plan digital right now, but there's a boatload of resources available if someone wants to add that. We're calling it a fuzzy QRP. And the reason is we've designed the amplifier so that it's capable of 20 watts of output. Actually, Al's done uh, tests on the amplifier 
and we've been able to get 35 watts out of it on 80 and 40, 25 on 20 meters, um, about 20 watts on 15, and about 12 to 13 watts on 10. We're making it user selectable. They can <coughs> dial whatever power output level they want. And we did that because we know that some QRP contests, for example, require five watts or less. So um, it's a fuzzy QRP in that it's adjustable. The other design goal was that we don't want it to be something that you have to tow to PC or a laptop or a tablet along with it. It's going to be, well, it is totally self-contained. There's no external hardware uh, required. Everything is contained uh, within the unit itself. We're calling it trunk portable. The reason that I'm saying that it's trunk portable is because by the time you add a heat sink and batteries for this puppy, it's not gonna be something that you're gonna to wanna to walk up an 8,000 foot mountain with uh, strapped in your backpack. Um, Al's best guess is it's gonna come in around 10 pounds. And while that's not real bad, it's also, if you're doing a soda activation or something, it's not exactly a light load. The next design goal, is we want it to be available at reasonable cost. And reasonable cost is, is kind of a, a fuzzy concept because it depends on the feature set that it has. We think that the features in the T41 EP compete very favorably with radios like uh, the ICOM 7300 uh, and some of the other modern SCR radios. In fact, I think we have features they don't have. So, to me, reasonable cost means around $200. We are in negotiation with a company that is going to produce the boards, and they're going to populate the boards with all of the SMD devices. Um, so it's going to be a semi kit where you're still going to have to wire up the encoders and uh, BNC connectors and things like that. But they think that they can do it for around 200 to 220. $220. And um, that includes the five inch display, which is the, uh, the low cost display. There's room for the software supports five, seven, and nine inch displays. The last design goal is that we want it to be open source. This is both open source hardware and software. Um, We've, Al and I both have been open source um, aficionados for, for years. And we want to encourage people to experiment with this. We want to encourage people to build it. And we want to encourage people to use it. So we think open source is the way to go. Uh, we're not going to make any money, any real money on this thing. We don't really care about it. We're also writing a book and we'll make some money on the book. So that's where will gain. Okay, this is a picture of the current display screen. Okay, let me get my mouse over here. And here you take the keyboard there. Okay, this says that we're on version 135. And believe it or not, we have gone through 135 iterations of the software. The T41, the reason we call it the T41 is because it's based on the Teensy 4.1 processor. Uh, for those of you who don't know anything about it, it's a four-core, quad-core, I think, isn't it? I think it's a quad-core with eight megabytes of RAM, a half a megabyte of, uh, I'm sorry, eight megabytes of flash, a half a megabyte of uh, SD RAM. And all of that is booked at uh, 600 uh, kilohertz. So megahertz. It, megahertz, sorry, it scoots along pretty quick. Okay, so the T41 then is at the heart of this thing. Over here in the larger letters is VFOA, and this is the current frequency uh, that's being listened to. And actually, while this looks like we're listening at 146, we're actually over here. We just changed this because 
actually we kind of like it better. This red line comes down to 7.1667 uh, on the um, frequency spectrum. And if you look at this line over here, it comes down and intercepts at 2.8 um, kilohertz. That is an audio plot of the signal that we're listening to right here at 7166. And we can adjust that frequency in real time uh, by simply turning one of the encoders. This little light violet line that you see here at the bottom, that's 2.8 kilohertz wide. This number right here is minus 2.8 kilohertz, which tells you that we're listening to the lower sideband. <coughs> and as you change that encoder and you can narrow or widen the band pass, these numbers will change and this little blip down here will also change. Below that, this of course, the spectrum display, and it shows that we're using a, a sample rate of 192 kilosamples per second. Um, another thing that's different about this radio versus a lot of the other ones, including the G90 from Zygu, is we can show, and we are showing right now, a 100 kilohertz slice of uh, bandwidth. The, um, the, the G90. I'm going to go up to 192. Go up to one, well, we can go up to 192. This is only showing 100 kilohertz right now. But um, the G90 only shows 25 kilohertz. So we considerably better than that. Below that, of course, is the typical waterfall display that you've seen before. These numbers down here at the bottom are actually debug statements that we have. And this one shows that the CPU temperature right now is 39.8 degrees Celsius. Uh, we monitor that because it does change with the amount of work that it does. The load factor that you see is the CPU load showing uh, what percentage of the processing power that we're currently using. And as you can <laughs> see, despite all the stuff that's going on here, we're only using 17% of the processor power. Uh, the S meter is the standard S meter everyone knows about. The volume is set at 60. Uh, the AGC right now, AGC is gray which means that, uh, or is that white? Yeah, it's on. Yeah, that's white, sorry. Um, that means that the AGC is active. If we get a signal strong enough, this would turn red. If the AGC is deactivated, then this would be a grayed out uh, shade similar in the color to these up here. The increment is currently set to 10K. That's adjustable down to 10 Hertz. And I'll show you how we do that. We do it in a rather odd way. This is not a touch screen display. It's capable of a touch screen, but we're not using it. We have a notch filter. We have noise reduction filters. We have a zoom. The zoom is used to scale this uh, spectrum frequency. We can make it larger or smaller by changing the zoom factor. Uh, compression, mic compression. The keyer, we're using straight key right now, and we have the decoder turned off. The CW decoder, when it's active, um, these debug statements would no longer be here, and the decoded Morse would be scrolling across the bottom, across uh, down here. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, this is the center line frequency. And the receive frequency is this red line that you see here coming down and intercepting the axis. We're tuning off to the yeah. side. They're individually changeable with encoders. Yeah, each, each can be changed with the encoders. Um, this one is, how fast can we go from end to end? Oh, I don't know. Well, it's 10, it's set at 10, oh, 10 it's, kilohertz, it's, so. It's 50. Um, this, is, this is 10. You can twist. Yeah, you can twist it and cover the entire band in a few seconds. Later. Yeah, we have a demo that shows that um, a little later on. Okay. 
Um, this shows some of the menuing system that we're using. This menu over here is called the primary menu. And this one over here in the green is what we call the secondary menu. So if you select AGC and press the select button, this menu pops up. And then you can turn the menu encoder and it will go slow, medium, fast, and off. And uh, then you hit the select button and that's the active. We also have some that do not call up the secondary menu. Like right here, we have the equalizer transmitter set. If you select that, this screen comes up and you can use the menu encoder then to set the um, equalizer um, levels for five different bands uh, in the audio band pass. Our goal um, with the SDT architecture, we're trying to move as much as we can as far as the functionality into the software. When we took this over from Frank's group in Germany, it was a single file with about 18,000 lines of C code. Um, as I mentioned before, we paired out some of the um, features that Frank and his group had put in like Riddy and some others. And um, we've broken it down to about 11,000 lines of C code. But more importantly, we broke it out into 20 different files. And there's a number of reasons for doing that. One of them is just easier to navigate around in, in the code. And the second thing is that it uses, it allows the IDE to use incremental compiles. And that may not sound like much, but I have a pretty fast machine at home. And when I make the first compile in the morning, it takes about a minute to compile the code. And as you, if you've done any software, you know you have a tendency to work on one file and then you'll recompile. With incremental compiles, the compiler is smart enough to know that the dirty flag is only set on that one file. So that's the only one that it compiles. The other 19 files are cached. And so the linker then stitches it all together into an executable. And that drops the compile time down from about a minute to maybe depending on the file you're working on to as little as five to 10 seconds. And that may not sound like much, but when you do 50 compiles a day, you save yourself a half an hour, 45 minutes worth of thumb twiddling. So it adds up. The architecture uses a quadrature sampling front end, uh, DALO detector. Al has done all that work. You wanna try and talk? Yeah, well. <clears throat> I, I don't think it's going to sound pretty, pretty, uh, pretty much like a, a frog. Um, <coughs> we've got some charts that show this coming up. Uh, basically, it, I can't talk. Okay. Sorry, guys. Um, we have in the book that we're, we're working on, it's 18 chapters long. Right now, 15 of the chapters are written, um, <laughs> including the digital signal processing chapter, which was a very difficult one for me to understand. Um, pretty easy for Al. But I think we've done a good job of explaining how the digital signal processing works to the point where somebody can go into our code. And after spending some time learning about digital signal processing, they can probably go in and hack our code. Um, and that's kind of the goal. But let me try here. One of the objectives <clears throat> was to explain all of this end to end. And if you go in the literature, you find that there's lots of information out there, but <clears throat> no one place where it all comes together. And what we're trying to do is go from the theory to actually building it with all the steps in between so that somebody can make modifications and understand what it is they're doing. Well, hopefully you can understand me. Yeah, we're trying to write almost 
I don't want to call it a textbook, but um, we're trying to do enough explanation that the person <coughs> who wades into the code is wading in with at least some background information on uh, how things work. Um, the sample rates that we're using are high end, uh, 192 kilohertz, um, wide spectrum display. Um, we're using, uh, what was I gonna say? Well, one, one, one point, the um, sample rate, there are lots of machines out there that sample at much higher rates. One of our objectives, however, was to make this thing affordable. And those high rate ADCs and DACs are pretty, pre pretty pricey. What we're using are inexpensive enough that it doesn't add that much to the overall cost. So we have um, what we think is a good trade-off between the amount of bandwidth and resolution versus the cost. If we wanted this to be a thousand dollar transceiver, no problem, we'd use the other, other chips. But to keep the cost low, we had to compromise in some fashion. That's why we're at the yeah, some the of the chips. ABCs are sixty dollars a piece, and I think ours are what eight? Yeah. So I suppose somebody, if they're really interested, could put in a, a better chip. But I, I think that most people are going to be very pleased with what they have. The whole key, key to the thing is usability, <coughs> and we think that it's very usable. It isn't the widest spectrum display in the world, but it is very usable. And uh, you can, you'll get uh, quite used to it very quickly. If anybody has ever tried to use the G90, uh, this is gonna seem wonderful by comparison. Um, we've designed the hardware so that it covers, it spans seven different boards and makes it easier to substitute your own board if you wish. Al has, Al has also um, designed the board so that there are 100 millimeters or less so that we can take advantage or you can take advantage of the um, specials that most software houses seem to have. Okay, this shows the SDR receive process. And um, I'm not sure that I need to spend a lot of time going over this. This is pretty standard fare for uh, any software defined radio. Let's see, three. three. Oh, we have three IFs. Um, what, three conversion? And. Um, the sampling, it, that's the first IF. It goes through, creates the ADC output, comes into baseband for the second IF. And then the third IF is plus or minus uh, 48 kilohertz um, mixed. And then uh, it comes back to the decimation process through an FFT process. And then we can go um, DSP digital signal processing on that and prepare the audio for the output. Everything that you see here in sort of the tan color is done in software. So a lot of the work is being done um, by the Teensy itself. The front end, the mic input, the low pass filter, the ADC, and then at the bottom, the DAC coming out of the software path and uh, the quadrature uh, modulator in the bottom and then the summing amp and then back out through the uh, <coughs> SSBR output. So that's the 
transmit process. This gives an idea of uh, what some of our filters look like. Let's see, this is the transmit uh, filter. And you can see we're putting in a lower sideband. This uh, is the upper sideband. Upper sideband, sorry. No carrier. That's no carrier. carrier. No second. No second harmonic, no third. No, no adjacent. Side no band. adjacent sideband. And it's flat. And Al spent a lot of time getting the top of that thing to be flat, but have reasonably skirt, reasonable skirts um, on the sides of the filter. We're very happy with uh, the performance of the filters that we have. Uh, this describes the transmit low pass filters, uh, seven element modified Butterworth. And we have modified, Al's actually designed our filter board so that if someone has used Hans's QCX filter boards for um, his kits, they can be plugged right into our filter board. So uh, you can repurpose those. Um, that's what the alternative alternate filters is talking about. Our own filters are a little bit better uh, performing, but that's because it's tuned to what we've done on the, the main filter board as well. Uh, pin diode mode switching. We have no relays um, for the mode switching. It's very fast. You can see the statistics, 0.2 milliseconds versus less than a hundredth of a millisecond and very good isolation. Uh, this is the response plant plots that you can see for 40 and 20, 15 and so forth. That's, that's just free. It's only 40. This shows three different filters. Oh, three different filters. And the one we chose. Oh, sorry, the one that we chose. We chose this is a comparison that Al did. Butter for the Butterworth, the Chebyshev, and the modified, which is, that's the one that we use was uh, the modified. And Al, I can't tell you how much time he spent uh, modeling all this stuff and building it, but it's turned out very, very effective. <clears throat> uh, mode switch, I'm not gonna go through that. I wanna get to the, um, Greater than 20 watts on single sideband and CW. Um, we're using the IF, IRF uh, 510. It's inexpensive. If you blow one, it's a buck or two, buck. a buck. And um, we are feeding it 25 volts through a boost supply for the, just the finals. Al has also worked in a thermal protection scheme on the uh, finals, the 510s, so that uh, it won't run away and, and blow them on a thermal runaway. He's got the current limited to under four amps. This is the output that, uh, output numbers that uh, Al actually measured. And as you can see, it's 35 on both uh, 80 and 40. Limited by the current limiter. Yeah, and the current limiter is what sets it at 35. And that, of course, was Al's decision. 25 on 20 meters, 20 watts on 15, and it's actually around 12 to 13 watts on, on 10 meters. We're still going to call it a 20-watt rig uh, just to stay on the safe side. Um, this shows the 25 watts, 7 megahertz output, and the uh, third order, order harmonic is uh, down 44 decibels and uh, everything falls within FCC specs. Tentative packaging. Um, we have a breadboard system set up here that's pretty large and it could be made smaller, but when we're working on it, we find it handy to have a lot of space. So. Even when you're done packaging, though, it's probably going to be portable, but not backpackable. The idea here is when I called it trunk portable, 
it's a radio that we want you to be able to take on vacation or something like that, throw in a trunk of the car. Um, the package has to be large enough to handle a 20 watt heat sink for the amplifier. Uh, we mentioned the multiple boards. Each of, of those boards are 100 by 100 or less. Lots of room on each board, easy access to test points, and we've got labeled test points on many of the boards at different points. Um, boards can be easily replaced. We have, um, we're using SMA connectors and cables between the boards, in some cases, audio cables. This is kind of a, a picture of the way our front currently looks. And, the, the thing that's probably a little odd is all of those holes that you see over on the right. And the reason is, is because we are using a matrix of 16 switches, push button switches. And each one of those is designed to accommodate the most often used options um, while you're operating the radio. I showed you pictures of some of the menus that appear at the top of the menu screen, but those are left less often used options. The ones that you see here are ones that you tend to use all the time. And the question is, why, why use push buttons? Well, my preference is, is because I got fat fingers and with a five inch display, I have to use some kind of a stylus to poke menu options, and I'm not very good at that. But if I can put my hand, the other thing is, um, even with the heat sink on it, there's a chance that poking at the menu display uh, will slide the transceiver across the table. I don't like that. But with this, I can put my right hand on the top of the radio, and with my thumb, I can press any one of those 16 switches and do a menu selection with one hand. So that's part of the reason for that particular layout. This is looking at that same layout. And at the bottom, you can see the encoder buttons on the right-hand side. That's the matrix that we were just talking about. And you can see the five-inch display. So we're looking down on the top. And you can see the pink area is the large heat sink. And the power amp, of course, clamps onto that. The boost converter is off to the left and the main power supply is below it. And then you can see the, the main board, which is the, the heart of the system that holds the Teensy. And we have a little cooling fan that we um, have on that one too. Uh, you can probably, optional, you can probably get away without it, but we put it on. Um, the, the next board is the receiver and the quadra quadrature sampling detector. Then we have the exciter and the detector. And then the last board on the extreme right is the filter board. <clears throat> this is what the current breadboard version looks like. And you can see the 16 matrix switch um, pattern off on the, on the right. The bottom button, the weird one that's all by itself, is our increment button that changes the frequency increment. The top left button in yellow is the select button. So if I have some kind of an option that I made maybe with an on-screen menu and I have to select something, I can press that. Otherwise, if I do like band up or band down, the, the extreme top row, the green, the rightmost green button is band up and right below it is a red button that's band down. So I can do band up and band down by just hitting those switches and uh, the display changes accordingly. And then the other options there are things like zoom and filters and um, the modulation type that you're using and so forth. Fast tune and tune, uh, we'll get to that a little more. Um, the volume control, self-explanatory. The filter was the, uh, audio filter, I showed you how you could move that in real time, left or right, to increase or decrease the audio bandpass. 
So those are the main controls and the way that we have them set out. If you were left-handed, you might want to totally reverse this and put the switch matrix on the left-hand side, all up to you. This is looking down on it. And Al has labeled uh, the different uh, components. And obviously we have a lot of empty space here because uh, we tend to move things around and uh, experiment with it ourselves. So uh, it's been a nice, Al designed the proto uh, typing system. It's worked out very, very well for us. This is a demo. <laughs> you can see the red line is moving. And you can see the audio display on the on the right. Notice the center frequencies moved to 198. <laughs> You'll notice we're also looking at about a hundred kilohertz slice. Changed it again. Hmm? Changed it. Oh, yeah. Center frequencies changed again, you'll notice. CW We're down in the CW band now. Of course, that's the FT8 frequency. Most of you can probably decode that in your head, right? Center frequency back again at 150. Pretty soon we're going to change the audio bandpass filter. And then you can see him changing it. CW. Down on CW again. And narrowing the filter down quite a bit. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> so where are we? We're finished.
Okay. I guess that's about it. We uh, we'll give you a live view here um, of the unit. Now, there's not much on the band right now. Somebody on. Este, yo los encontré en el en YouTube por ahí un tubo tutorial de un americano. El menos. Probably Cuba. Uh, Al just changed the twenty meters. Pretty dead. Pretty dead. We well, yeah. we also have a uh, the noise reduction. Noise on. Two of the boards. Okay, that's it. Get my voice back, get my picture back, and uh, I will switch this thing into a different mode. And uh, we're looking for uh, uh, any questions, raise your hands, or uh, uh, there's nothing in chat I saw. <coughs> I'll double check with you, Barry. There's three or four questions in the chat. Okay, good. Check, uh, let's hear them. Jim from uh, KN4UJW wants to know what operating system and development framework are you using? Uh, everything's being done uh, in the Arduino IDE under Windows. Um, it's a low cost, free environment. That was one of the requirements that uh, Al and I had going in was to. Uh, make the software tools free, uh, if not free, low cost. But fortunately, all of the tools that we've used, all of the libraries that we've used are at zero cost to the end user. Okay, that's great. Okay, and Oscar had some questions. Uh, what is the frequency stability with the time and transmit time? Um. <coughs> He's writing it down. I don't think we've been asked that question before. Leave it to Oscar. <clears throat> Let me see if I can read what he wrote here. Um, it's Okay, it's controlled by the SI5351 chip. And so it's going to be as good as that chip, which is very good. Um, we have also tried, we know that there's a chip shortage for the SI5351. We are also um, using the MS5351 from China. And it actually seems better than the 5351 from uh, Silicon Lab, so uh, we expect it to be very, very good. Okay. Are you planning to make a touchscreen control? A what? A what? Touchscreen control instead of the buttons. 
Yeah, no. No. Okay. Okay. I think there again, we have 11,000 lines of C code in here. Actually, it's probably closer to 12 now. And we are using 3% of flash memory. So anyone who wants to do things like that has 97% of flash memory available to them and about uh, almost two or 300K of SRAM to play with. So um, the, uh, the display is capable of touch and the wires are there, are there. So if someone wants to code it, it's not, not a problem. Yeah, the, the, the display screen comes from buydisplay.com in China and it's based on the RA8875 chip. And <laughs> that has complete touchscreen capability built into it. Uh, the entire library does. So if someone wants to do that, it would not be that difficult. And there's plenty of resources available on the Teensy to do it. We just, we did it with the Jackal. Um, we did a touchscreen display and we were not happy with it. Screen space too. And yeah, plus screen space. Um, you have to develop some kind of paging system or something to um, get the menus out of the way when you're not using them to get back to the display that you really want to see. So that's another reason that we just chose not to do it that way. Okay. Are there any known birdies? But, uh, actually, it's almost perfect. Oh. Uh, <laughs> we we know that we have a couple of glitches that we have to iron out, <clears throat> and um, we will have that done before the uh, software is released. And if you're interested in the software release date, our best estimate is it's going to be the first quarter of next year. We're trying to get the book done by January 15th. Um, that may be ambitious, but we're shooting for that. Okay. And what about after sales support? Um, that's really tough on a kit. Uh, we are not, we are not going to get into that. This is an experimenter's kit. <clears throat> um, we have a website. Uh, software controlled ham radio that uh, is a clearinghouse for all kinds of questions, not just on this project, but on a bunch of other ones that we've done. We have over 2,000 members on that website, and every one of them is interested in helping everyone else. So, any support's probably going to go through that website, and uh, it'll be the users and others like us who jump in and try and help out. But as far as mailing things back to us and asking us to fix it, that's just not, not going to happen. We'll answer questions. We'll answer questions, of course. It's, it's open source, so the open source community will help. Yes. That's correct. And uh, Oscar also wants to know about USB radio control. I ha We haven't. We've been asked that before. We have nothing in mind for it. Um, Again, part of it, we hit, you know, yeah, I was pointing to a connector that is already on the, the Teensy that allows a USB connector to be routed right into the Teensy. So adding CAT control or USB control would not be a difficult job to do. But we've got too much on our plate right now to worry about it. So. As far as us doing it right now, the answer is going to be no. Okay, that takes care of everything in the chat, Dan. Okay. okay. Sounds good. I don't see any hands raised here. Um, Al, um, either one of you, actually, when you when we get done with this presentation, can you send me the, uh, the um, PDF on this or the, the slides on this so we can get it? Sure. Okay, Larry's got his hand help up there. Go ahead, Larry. <coughs> Can you vote his web address first? I'm sorry? Web address again? Go ahead. Okay, software controlled ham radio. Just do a search on that and you'll find the website. Okay. Okay, is the uh, this equipment that you uh, showed us 
and the components, are they going to be on that website also so we could uh, maybe get back something like this? We're, we're going to have um, the BOM will be on the website um, as soon as we get it set. So you'll have all the component parts listed in those BOMs book first. Oh, yeah, the book. The book is going to probably come out before the company starts producing the boards. So um, we will announce the availability of the book on that website and it will be sold through Amazon. Also, what is your uh, swag on approximate cost? Well, we, we're pretty sure that it can be built for under $200, but the company is saying the company that we're working with thinks that they can target it for around 220. So um, that gives them some markup and still holds it at a reasonable cost, I think. Well, personally, I think that's great what you're doing and uh, getting that price down is going to really open up the HF to, uh, world to a lot of people. Well, we hope that it's in a lawn mowing budget for a lot of people. I like that terminology, lawn mowing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any, anything else out there? Been a great presentation, guys. Well, thank you, Dan. Appreciate it. And uh, Dennis, it was really good talking with you. Enjoyed it. Lisa, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, Val. <laughs> no, just kidding. He's a great guy. Uh, Why do you think I snagged him? <laughs> well, that's not the story he tells me, but that's uh oh. Uh -oh. Yeah. <coughs> you weren't supposed to tell her that. Thanks for having us, guys. We, we enjoyed yeah. it. Great to have you here. And, and uh, <laughs> sorry that Al, you're uh, still under the weather with the bronchitis. That's a drag. But I feel good. That's the good thing. Yeah. Feel good, but yeah, it would be a better talk without speaking. <laughs> Thank you. Good stuff. Coming too. All right, as I've always said before, uh, when I close these things out, you can come right back in just like you did before and visit. It's like you know, and talk about whatever you want to talk about. The first person that comes back in assumes the host, so let you know that that person. Uh, if he goes out, you'll have to come back in again. <coughs> so come back in and, and chit chat, and it often happens. It's a, more of a routine. So with that, I'm going to say 73 is everyone. It's been a great presentation, you guys. And uh, everybody, thank you. See thank you. Later. See you later. All right. Okay. Thank you. And if you send me that file, Al or somebody, I'll appreciate it. Yeah. Jack, do you want to come back and visit a little bit? I, I would, but it's Jane's it's, sick at home. Oh, um, no. Okay. Well, no. we'll do it another time. We'll do this another time. Let's, yeah, let's plan a Zoom. Right yeah, to me. let's do it. Right this is me. great. Okay. Thanks see for you joining later. us. See nice you. Nice to meet you. Bye. Good to see you. 7-3. Seven, 7-3. Three. Seven, three. Take care, Dan. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> Thank you.